Latch the windows, lock the doors, and put the kids to bed. It's time for another episode of Tales from the Garage. Guys, I'm back again. This time, I better do this now or I'm never going to get to it. Um, part four, the final chapter, Terry Riley. I got about a, I got a half a dozen CDs, and I'm just hoping I can keep this under 17 hours. Um, hmm, where do I start? I made a lot of mental notes, and I know what's going to happen is I'm going to remember half of them. And as soon as I'm done recording the video, I'm going to remember the other half. But I'm only giving this one shot because um, I don't know how, how how worth it is it to anyone to go into such detail. Um, for the most part, you know, I was initially attempting to um, do these in some kind of logical order, you know, with mostly Terry Riley. Uh, performance albums in, in one section and uh, maybe collaborations in another section and uh, I, I don't I'm only was only partially successful at that um, but um, today uh, I've got a couple uh, I've got mostly uh, Terry Riley works uh, for, of more recent vintage. Um, I think everything here, uh, the oldest goes back to 1988, recorded in 88, released in 89. So it's more of the current stuff. We're not going back to the 60s or 70s. Um, and just barely skirting into the 80s. So the first couple things I'm, I'm going to show are um, kind of like conceptual works that Terry does play uh, in collaboration with other musicians or contributors um, and um, well let me start let me start the first thing anyway is uh, a more of more recent vintage of uh, Terry and uh, actually it's not the one I have playing because I, I I've already screwed up the order so let me uh, let me go to the one I'm going to show now to what extent you can hear the music because it's very difficult for me to work out the audio level um, I will once again be attempting to play the albums that I'm speaking about, uh, so the music in the background to whatever extent you can hear it, is from the albums I'm talking about. Um, the only catch is I'm a little concerned with the copyright thing because I know with the other Terry Riley uh, videos I did, I did get copyright warnings. And the bad thing, of course, is that, uh, you know, if they decide to, they could mute the audio for specific sections so you'll see me mouthing the words but you won't hear anything um, I hope that won't be the case I know I'm gonna get the copyright notice anyway um, so this first thing is in, in uh, an unusual kind of like a concept album that Terry Riley did um, what year is it I want to say it's it's the late 90s uh, I'm looking it up here but I've got a long list of his albums and it's not coming up. Anyway, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say it's 2000 and 2004, I think. Maybe that's why I'm not seeing it because the list only goes up to 2002. Mm, yeah, I think yes, 2000, 2002, an album called Atlantis Nath, N A T H. Um, Kind of, kind of a concept album. Part of it's based on his um, his Indian uh, music teacher that he learned uh, traditional Indian uh, voice from. I think maybe tabla as well. Um, and long been his kind of mentor, I guess you could call him. So it's um, a nice, interesting digi digipack 
some very nice artwork on it. Um, like I said, it's called Atlantis Nath. It's Terry is the main performer on this. There's other performers as well. Uh, very nice digipack from about 2002. Folds out several times. I mean, this would have been a hell of an LP in terms of art. Uh, there's the CD in there. Terry's doing voice on here. He's doing piano. Um, I guess synthesizer. They credit it as being MIDI. So, uh, you know, it's, I, I guess it's got to be synthesizer or a MIDI piano. But um, it's a little strange that they don't specify um, what the MIDI instruments are. He's got collaborators, a guy, Luke Martinez, which is a little bit odd because Luke Martinez actually contributes a couple pieces that weren't written by Terry. A couple small, uh, short pieces, like a minute, three minutes long. Um, and they're almost... Um, when I heard them, I knew they weren't Terry Riley because they, they're less music and they're more um, environmental sound kind of things, you know, where like he may have taken uh, recordings from sounds outside and processed them. So, you know, it doesn't sound like an instrument being played so much. Uh, and when I heard it, I'm like, yeah, that doesn't sound like something Terry Riley would do. So I don't really know. According to Terry Riley's somewhere I read, I guess he, he thought that it, it helped convey, I guess, the concept of the album. Not that you really even need to know it. The print is so small inside of here that that I, I, I haven't even bothered to read it. That, that It's so impossibly small, you have to get a magnifying glass to read it. Um, but there's a guy that does some spoken text on here. Like I said, the, the couple pieces inserted by Luke Martinez that are between the Terry Riley pieces, the album could have done without. They're interesting little, little sound effect tone poem things. I don't really know how you describe it. Uh, it. It's an interesting album. It's definitely one that I'm not sorry I picked up. You know, in, in, in the Terry Riley world, like I said, there's things which are difficult. And there's things that I, you know, are kind of hesitant to recommend, except for somebody who's already a hardcore Terry Riley fan. This still would not be, you know, in the, you know, in the first five or so albums I would suggest to maybe pick up by, te by Terry, but it is um, a good example of, of what he has in more current years been doing. There's a lot of overdubbed voice on here. There are some lyrics. And I don't know if it was this particular album or another one where he sings lyrics, but um, I was listening to these recently, and it struck me that his voice sound, sounds a lot... His, when he sings lyrics, I prefer when he does chanting, like you hear him doing in the background now, or wordless vocals as he does a tiny bit, but but extremely well and and absolutely perfect in the... Uh, in the the, um, the lifespan movie soundtrack, uh, there's some wordless vocals in there which are just absolutely beautiful and fantastic. I wouldn't call them chanting, but um, they're really effective. Uh, I like the the chanting's not bad either. When he gets when he starts doing the um, singing lyrics, which he does on on several of these albums, even a couple of them that I've already showed. Uh, that's where it gets a little weak for me. And his, his and I remember listening to these to prepare doing the video. And uh, it struck me that um, his voice sounds a lot like, who does it remind me of? Uh, it reminds me of Robert Wyatt. Uh, probably 90% Robert Wyatt and 10% David Allen from Gone. And I thought, gee, maybe, I don't think that's just me. And I happened to go online at, on Amazon and I was reading... Um, somebody's uh, review of, of the particular album that I was listening to that has vocals on it. And I'll be damned if the guy didn't say the exact same thing that I was just thinking from a review that had been written years before, saying, his singing voice sounds like a cross between Robert White and David Allen. And I thought, wow, that's really... I must be right then, because um, th exactly what I thought. Um, so this is, this is a nice... Uh, I would say... If you're somebody that's kind of 
following Terry Riley and what he's been up to and the different areas that he's worked in. Um, this is probably, you know, I, I'm, I don't have everything Terry did, but um, this Atlantis Nath is probably one of the ones you would have to pick up. It's not as accessible as, other, as some of his works. It is a lot more accessible than some of his other things, though. And uh, it's got a combination of instruments in here, you know, with Terry doing piano and some MIDI electronic stuff. He does quite a bit of voice in here, a regular piano. Um, there's also a, um, a string quartet that plays along with him, um, along with synthesizer. There's a guy who plays a fretless acoustic guitar on one track. Um, and as I mentioned, a guy that does spoken text on, on the, the last track. So there's uh, a, a bit of variety. It's, I'm not going to, I kid you not, it's certainly an odd album. Um, and it, uh, you know, I would definitely call it avant-garde and experimental, but it's not as difficult as a lot of the things that he's done. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things you got to be in the mood for it, though. Moving on. I have to change the music now, so I gotta go back a couple screens here. Okay. Now you hear guitar. You should hear guitar. A little bit. Here's another The Book of Abby Y. Zud, which is something that um, Terry made up. Uh, another, I guess, concept album of, of pieces of his. Um, this one I, is uh, where we're getting toward Terry's albums now done as a composer where he doesn't necessarily play on them. Uh, perhaps a little bit, uh, and in a lot of cases, not at all. And I don't think he plays on this album at all. He's listed only as being the composer. It's uh, There's a percussionist who plays marimba and hand drums uh, on, on a couple tracks. And um, Tracy Silverman is the violinist. He was in one of the... Uh, was it... Uh, that Wyndham Hill String Quartet thing he was an original member of. I can't remember the name. Um, Turtle Island String Quartet, I think. Um, most of the guitar, most of the music is geared toward um, nylon string guitars, actually played by uh, a guy, David Tannenbaum, and also by Terry's son, Guy and Riley, who's a, a pretty damn good guitarist, but he, he went to university and actually studied music, so, um, you know, and, and, and he's, for a guy born 1977, too, he's, he's uh, you know, a young guy, <laughs> in my mind, and a uh, hell of a guitarist, the music is, the music is um, not what you'd expect, most of the music is the nylon string guitar, um, often in duos, um, so it's, it's essentially, essentially like a live recording of um, the various pieces have different combinations. There is, uh, I think, one piece that's for three guitars together. There's another piece, I think, for two guitars. Uh, and I believe all these things were recorded essentially live in the studio. Uh, there's, a, there's a piece that um, I think is the guitar and percussion is on all different kind of percussion instruments. Uh, not, not heavy in the drum world so much, lighter percussion than that and marimba. Um, the big part of the album is um, guitar, the, the classical guitar in duet with violin, and it's kind of it's kind of odd. This is you know not one of those that I would go and, and, and necessarily recommend. There's Terry, and that's um, that's not his son with him on the back cover, even though his son is quite prominent on the album. It's actually guitarist David Tannenbaum. And uh, most of the music is essentially the, the pieces range. Uh, a lot of guitar and violin pieces. And it's not kind of what I expected when I saw guitar and violin. I figured the guitar would be playing chords and the violin would be playing these kind of semi-pretty melodies over it. It's more frantic than that. And it, it's oddly, um, the guitar is playing in a, kind of similar to the violin in a way. It's playing a lot of um, very fast single note runs or runs that, you know, there's a whole bunch of very fast runs on the guitar, uh, single note runs, and 
it may end in a broken chord, like two or three notes or something like that, but it fades away really quickly. And the violin is also playing a little bit frantically over that. And it's not very full sounding because the guitar is not playing chords supporting the violin. It's almost as if two violins were playing or something like that. Um, so it, it has a, a, a kind of odd flavor to a lot of those pieces that have the guitar and the violin in them. Um, there are sections where the guitar plays some chords, so you've got a, a fuller, more kind of traditional sounding thing. But it's it's an odd composition. Um, the larger composition is a piece called Cantos Desert Desertos Desertos, I guess is how it's pronounced, uh, and that's a multi a six five five part um, composition that has the guitars and the guitar and uh, percussion and the guitar and violin and it, it's it, it's a little bit on the weird side you know it's it's over my head a little bit um, there's um, a couple more pieces that uh, because they have more than one guitar in them are a little fuller sounding maybe more what you would expect but it's it's a little bit of an odd album and a little bit of a hard sell for me you know it, it, it's uh, yeah it's 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 odd you know it's and this is from uh, year 1999 this came out and the pieces were all, all written around that time uh, you know in the, in the late 90s so it's you know again this is something that uh, is of more recent vintage. But, uh, you know, I have to be honest, it's, uh, yeah, I've been listening to this, well, back when I started my series, I was really heavily listening to a lot of Terry Riley uh, in order to prepare for this. It's, it's an odd one. Not, not easy to get into. Uh, like I said, I, I think it's just over my head. It might be one that, you know, in 20 years, if I'm still around, I might go, oh, I get it now. I get it now. Um, so we're, we're kind of in the... Um, Kind of in the world of Terry Riley composer now and not performer. Um, and here's a really interesting one, which um, I have to switch the music again because I, I want to be proper about this, but first I have to find it. Here we go. Here's one of the, and I've spoken on a, on a previous part about. Um, one of his albums I have that has a particularly poor version of NC, kind of like NC for uh, a rock band in the early 70s, which is, as I mentioned, probably the, the worst version of NC you'd ever want to hear. Um, I have another version of NC, which uh, is one that, if you're interested in NC, uh, beyond the original late 1960s, uh, version of it, which really is the version you should hear first and you should get. Um, but after that, because of the concept of the piece in C, and every performance of it will be different, uh, you could, you know, basically spend a day listening to all the different versions of NC and potentially not get tired of it because every performance is different. Because of the, um, it leaves a lot up to the size of the group, which can, can vary and what the uh, individual instrumentalists in that group choose to play in terms of they have specific parts to play but how frequently they um, repeat the phrases or where and when they choose to repeat the phrases that they're given for their instrument are entirely up to them meaning every performance would be different plus the instrumentation can be different so it's not necessarily even um, set on a specific set of instruments, like in a classical orchestra. So, when did they record this? Uh, January of 1989, a Chinese, Chinese orchestra decides to record a version of In C. The Shanghai, Shanghai Film Orchestra. And uh, does a version, it's about 28 and a half minutes, there are other compositions on here that are not by Terry Riley, which are worthwhile listening to, but you know I don't want to get into that because then the, 
then the video will go on to be about 24 hours long. Um, but uh, there is a version, uh, 28 and a half minutes of NC, done by a, a rather large Chinese orchestra, and so they have different instrumentation than what you would hear from an American orchestra. Or in fact, uh, a lot of permeations in America of the various musicians that have performed in C, because whether they choose um, purely orchestral instruments or maybe more American modern instruments, there's a similarity there in the various American versions, whereas in the Chinese versions, you've got all these unique, interesting ethnic instruments playing in C. Uh, it, and it really works well. Uh, it was recorded, and what label is this on? This is pre, I think it's pretty regularly, uh, easily available. Uh, da, 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 da. This is on Celestial Harmonies. Uh, you know what I'm wondering? I think they're still around. I think Celestial Harmonies is still around. I hope they are. A really good label. Um, and I just, I just don't recall having seen anything very recent from them, unfortunately. Uh, but this was, uh, yeah, I think this is still available. Highly recommended um, after you hear the original in C. Uh, recorded January 1989. It was mixed in March of 1989. And here's the interesting thing, but it's not explained anywhere in the liner notes. It was recorded in China naturally, but the tapes were brought back to California where they were mixed by Terry Riley, trumpeter John Hassel, who doesn't play on it, and Brian Eno. Um, and there's no explanation as to why these two folks were involved in the mixing at all. I can see Terry Riley being involved in, in the mixing of it. I don't know why Brian Eno and John Hassel were involved in the mixing, which is something I had completely forgot about uh, until I pulled this out to, to listen to again. Very interesting, and, and an interesting, interesting piece. Uh, okay, now I have to find. Uh, I think this is what I'm looking. Yes, this is what I'm looking for. Okay, one of my favorite um, Terry Riley albums, uh, which is a Terry Riley composer album that Terry does not play on, because it works really well. Uh, is this one this is on New Albion Records by the Rova R-O-V-A Saxophone Quartet um, Chanting the Light of Foresight and what year is this from? I want to say the late 90s uh, 1994 so you know it's definitely um, modern times um, you know, the funny thing is, I'm not necessarily in love with saxophone quartets. So the reason that I like this so much is not because I'm, I'm in love with saxophone quartets, um, but rather it works really well. It just works well. You know, Terry wrote these pieces, I believe specifically for Rova, for Rova Saxophone Quartet. And it's pretty deep, it's pretty intense, and... One thing that I, I had assumed, and listening closely to it, um, this, this comes up time and time again. Uh, it seems that when Terry Riley writes for, for small ensembles, uh, here you have Rova Saxophone Quartet, there, I always assumed that the pieces were written strictly for a, a quartet setting. Uh, and I'm fairly sure there are pieces on here that may be just for quartet, but I also am hearing uh, in in one of the large scale pieces, there's like a 17 minute piece on here. Um, I'm hearing a, an awful lot of sounds for a saxophone quartet, and then it dawned on me is maybe Terry's not necessarily writing um, just for a live quartet setting, but he's writing for the band, meaning um, I believe there's overdubs in here. So there may be eight parts. Uh, there's a, a longer piece on here that I said, look, that is about 17 minutes. And 
it sounds like there's way more than four saxophones going on. Um, it almost sounds like a mini, if you weren't really focused in on the sound, it almost sounds like a mini classical orchestra. So I don't necessarily think when Terry writes for these ensembles that he's strictly writing for them in a live context. Um, because the, the big piece on here, the 17 minute piece, there's an awful lot of colors in there and, and there's an awful lot of stuff going on that doesn't sound to me to be so much studio manipulation, you know, to make the sound bigger, but rather I think there's overdubbing going on, which is interesting. So it may be Terry writing for the musicians and not just the live ensemble. Um, if you really like saxophones and you like saxophone quartets, you would love this, but I, I think this is one of his um, very successful in terms of, you know, musically, you can really sit down and get into it. Uh, albums, you know, where, that Terry doesn't do any performing on, but he does, you know, compose all the music for the ensemble. So, um, Chanting the Light of Foresight from Rova Saxophone Quartet. This is already running a lot longer than I hoped it would. And I ain't done. I ain't done. I am showing everything I have by Terry though, so there won't be a sequel to this until I pick up a whole uh, another batch of Terry's things, which would be some time. So, one of the best known, um, probably the, the most well-known um, group of musicians that um, Terry Riley wrote pieces for uh, that he didn't necessarily perform with is um, the Kronos Quartet, which is a string quartet. Uh, I, I don't know. He, the first album he wrote fully, the entire album for the group, came out in 1985, uh, called Cadenza on the Night Plane. And I think it was, it was a pretty big deal album because I remember hearing a lot about it. Uh, you know, and I don't know if it was, you know, like nominated for um, Grammys or anything like that in the in the classical world. It, my guess is it probably was. Um, and for years I thought I had the album. But I don't. I, I was getting it confused. I don't actually have Cadenza on the night plane. Which, like I said, came out in... Uh, a, I, I switched windows now, so I lost the dates of everything. Came out in 85. 84. Um, but... In 1989... Uh, he wrote uh, again for the Kronos Quartet, which is a string quartet, uh, a, a two-record set called Salome Dances Dances for Peace. Yes, Salome Dances for Peace. This is a, the old fat. Remember when the, the two CD sets used to come in these real fat boy boxes? Um, well, that's what this is. So five years after his first full album written for the Kronos Quartet, uh, Terry went back in and dove in and did it more, uh, writing almost two hours, an hour and 58 minutes worth of music for the Kronos String Quartet. Um, looking at it, when I looked up the data for this, I was a little surprised that, at least in America, um, this particular album came out on my 30th birthday in 1989, in late October. It actually came out on my 30th birthday. Now, 1989 was before the internet and everything, so you tended not to find out about albums uh, very quickly until you went out to the store, you know, which is why, you know, back then, um, I went to the record stores quite a lot. I, I don't think a month would pass by that I didn't go into a record store because you never knew what was going to come out in any given week. You know, except for, you know, if you were heavily into like the biggest rock bands that were around, you know, if Led Zeppelin or the Rolling Stones or something like that were coming out with a new album, you might hear about that in advance. Uh, but there was no internet to find out about this stuff. Uh, TV wasn't going to talk about it. But this was apparently a big album that came out, and I remember walking into the store, I actually have the receipt here in the box, early in February. So um, just a couple months after the album was actually released, and it was probably just 
getting to the stores because you have to realize even though this was a big deal and a big classical album at the time uh, the only records that most most record stores would make sure that they had on release day were the popular stuff you know the rock stuff the pop stuff um, they were less concerned with making sure they got a classical record in the week that it was released you know even one that could be potentially uh, a hit in the classical world but this was a big deal this fat boy this two two disc set now for me personally I am not a fan of string quartets and in fact the only full albums of string quartet music I have are the ones that Terry Riley wrote and I remember I think I, I, I may have not even been aware that this album was out but uh, in the classical section I believe it was on display as a new release in the long uh, if you remember the CD long boxes the cardboard boxes they used to have and uh, in each section of this particular store that I would shop at they had you know the new releases in the rock section and the new releases in the jazz section and I believe the reason I found out about this was because it was prominently displayed in the new releases of the classical section and I saw it with string quartet I am just not a fan of string quartets the music is too samey sounding for me um, you know it, it's, it's I have string quartet pieces on various classical albums uh, you know where you've got a classical album by a specific composer you know but he and, and he happened to write a piece for string quartet but he also wrote pieces for piano and pieces for orchestra uh, or just general compilation classical albums different pieces by different artists I do have string quartets on there but I didn't have any uh, just full albums that were just string quartets but being such a hardcore fan already in 1989 of Terry Riley I decided well I'm gonna I'm gonna bite the bullet I'm gonna shell out the $23 and um, you know for almost two hours worth of string quartet music and uh, you know it wasn't the easiest thing to get into but it's not terribly avant-garde but like I mentioned in the previous album now listening back to this because it was a few years it's been a few years since I listened to this and then I, I pulled this out and started listening again to all of my day and night actually for several weeks I had my Terry Riley stuff in rotation and that was probably also one of the things that kind of helped me get into the the, the the classical thing that I've been in now especially that the warm weather came but this even predated that because it was still the weather was still a, a bit on the cool side when I started listening to this stuff and by the time I was kind of done playing it on, on a daily basis the weather was warm and all of a sudden I found myself in the classical mode that I spoke about in my other videos that are previous my pre previous videos so yes uh, string quartet's a hard sell for me and almost two hours of string quartet is a hard sell but it's Terry Riley now the thing listening to this again that I noticed that I hadn't noticed before like I mentioned on the Rova saxophone quartet uh, listening closely to that I, I believe that there's pieces with overdubbing on there now there's a lot of pieces on here that are evidently obviously strictly for the live string quartet however I believe it's the first piece on here which is a bit of a larger scale piece I'm hearing an awful lot for a string quartet and it's only upon listening to this is all I think there's at least two parts for every player in here in other words it sounds like they recorded a string quartet and they recorded another string quartet over it which is making me think that when Terry Riley writes for these groups he does write some material for the live group as it exists with its number of players however many there are but he also um, writes for what the band is capable of doing in the studio not necessarily live in other words there's more than four parts going on here I'm sure especially in the the first piece which is 11 minutes long so it's one of the larger longer uh, scale pieces I hear an awful lot going on an awful lot going on in fact it sounds like a the whole string section of an orchestra at times uh, which is an interesting way of doing it and also um, it, it does help the depth of the piece a little bit and also uh, 
it prevents every piece from having the, the you know, over the course of two hours, of having a, a, a samey sound. But still, you know, even with the overdubs, which makes a nice, uh, it gives a lot more depth to the pieces that apparently there's there's some overdubbing on um, than just the standard string quartet. But it still it still is two hours of string quartet music, you know, or essentially for those four instruments. Um, and I know in, in recent years, um, there has been, I believe, a fourth album in the series uh, that Terry, I uh, thought I saw it listed somewhere, that Terry wrote again for the Kronos Quartet uh, in, in recent years. I do have the third one, which comes after this from 1989. Um, Another album, the third full album, uh, called uh, Re Requiem for Adam, which is the third in the series of albums that um, Terry wrote for the Chronos Quartet. And I'm trying to find out what year it was from. Uh, 20 something. But I'm not seeing it here. Well, uh, I'm gonna say, I'm going to say 2000. Damn it! You know, I looked all these up, but the list of his works is so long, I can't find it now. It's a none such album. Damn it! Yeah, I want to say, I want to say, I want to say about 2001, but for some reason. It's not listed in this one. Let me look. I, I have uh, two discographies um, listed here. Yes, 2001. That was right. Requiem for Adam is the third album written by Terry Riley for the Kronos Quartet. This one is quite a bit different from the others. And unless you're a hard, hard, hardcore fan uh, and you really want to hear a, you know, a full album of just string quartet music. This is the one that I would recommend to folks. Now I only have two out of the four, but um, I know, for instance, Cadenza on the Night Plane, the first album that he recorded for Kronos Quartet, is strictly the Kronos Quartet playing. On this one, there's a three-piece composition which runs under 42 minutes. This is a very short album. This is about 47 minutes, this album. Um, so it's much shorter than even the individual, uh, the two individual albums in the previous Kronos Quartet album. So it's a 41 minute, uh, for about 42 minute piece is called Requiem for Adam, which was a piece that was written in memoriam of one of the Kronos Quartet uh, players, one of the founding members. His son passed away as a teenager. And uh, Terry basically wrote this piece for them, uh, for the Kronos Quartet um, in remembrance of Adam, who was the son of, I want to say it's David Harrington, the violin player, I'm pretty sure, yeah, of the Kronos Quartet. And it's a 42 minute piece, it's in three parts, uh, and parts one and two are for the quartet. Now again, I haven't listened to this in a couple weeks, but but I, I think they're they're I'm not sure on, on either the, the first or second part. There may be overdubbing because it seems to be a, a quite a bit of depth to the recording, and sometimes it's hard to tell. Is it just the way that the studio, the recording studio, is used, or are there more than one part? In other words, it's not just a quartet playing. That I'm not sure of. The difference in this one though is there's a, a second part that's the shortest part. It runs about seven minutes. It actually has Terry Riley playing synthesizers on it, or MIDI stuff. And you know, so you have this first part that starts with a with the strings, and then all of a sudden there's a, a goes into the second part where there's this big percussion crash, which is Terry playing uh, basically sampled percussion on a keyboard. And then he kind of settles down a little bit, but it, it's very jarring because you're listening to a, you know, what you think is a string quartet album. Uh, the second part suddenly starts with this bang and crash 
of um, sampled percussion that's actually played by Terry. And it, then it goes into, uh, well, I'm going to, I'm going to play it. There we go. There it is. And I hope it's not too loud. Um, it's quite jarring after you hear this, this, this very long, um, 13 and a half minute section devoted to, um, strictly strings all of a sudden have this like rat-a-tat percussion and explosive percussion going on but it's um, does settle down into basically almost like um, I say like a synthesizer orchestra where Terry's using uh, a lot of the sounds of horns sampled horns uh, played on a keyboard and the Kronos Quartet is playing along with Terry's parts, and Terry's parts are overdubbed, so there's a few things going on. And But oddly enough, the string quartet is actually more in the background, so it kind of sounds like an orchestral backing um, that's just supporting what Terry's playing on, on the keyboard. And most of the keyboard is kind of aping other orchestral um, instruments that aren't like string instruments. So there's horns and percussion sounds. It's really interesting, but it only goes on for seven minutes before it goes into the third part, which is 21 minutes long, which is strictly, again, uh, the Kronos Quartet, string quartet. But after hearing that second part, that's that seven minute part, where Terry's doing his weird things on the synthesizer, with the orchestra supporting him, uh, I wish that Terry would do a full album like that. This would be really interesting. Um, like I said, this whole piece is only 42 minutes long, but I think it really encapsulates Terry's writing for the Kronos Quartet in a nice way. Uh, you know, take away the, the seven minutes of the second part, which is mostly Terry on synthesizers, and you only actually have uh, about 35 minutes of the Kronos Quartet by themselves strictly as a string group. Um, I won't say live because I think there's some overdubbing going on there. But this whole album has maybe about 35 minutes of the actual just Kronos Quartet playing by themselves. So it's not a whole, whole lot of string quartet music. And the album ends, maybe because it's so short or for whatever reason, they included um, a just under six minute solo piano piece uh, that Terry Riley was um, working on in the studio at the same time that, um, that either he was writing the piece for the Chrono Quartet or the uh, recording of the piece for the Kronos Quartet was going on. I'm not sure. But um, Terry was also working on other music outside of for the Kronos Quartet project. And maybe because the album is so short or whatever, they included also included this uh, six-minute piano piece, solo piano, by Terry, which ends the album. And it's not really supposedly connected to this Requiem for Adam, but I have to say that, man, it makes the album flow really nicely because you have the first piece by the Kronos Quartet and you have the strings going on. That weird second piece where all of a sudden Terry's on synthesizers and he's banging on, you know, sampled percussion and all this wild stuff is going on. Um, and then another 21 and a half minutes, all of a sudden the Kronos Quartet comes back on the string quartet and then that, that piece ends. And then you go down to this solo piano piece for about six minutes. And it's almost like he could have intended it to be the last section of the Requiem for Adam instead of a completely separate piece that it is, um, really unconnected to the Requiem. Uh, it just makes the album flow nice, uh, has a nice ending to it. As a result, uh, a, a bit more colors on it than the other albums where he wrote music for the Kronos Quartet because of his involvement on keyboards. And um, yeah, so this is one that, you know, is definitely in my in my to, to get list, you know, and, and really if you're following Terry Riley, you know, at all, um, you probably do have to pick up something that he did for the Kronos Quartet 
simply because he's been involved with them now since 1984 or so. And his records, you know, the, the, the pieces that he writes for them are a big deal. There's a lot of them now. Um, and it's apparently still an ongoing thing because there has been in, in more recent years another album that, that of pieces he wrote for them, which I have to check out. I don't know what that consists of. Um, so, uh, this went on a lot longer than I wanted it to, but that is everything. Uh, and I was actually going to jump back and talk a little bit more about the lifespan soundtracks and things like that, but, you know, it's, it's, it's already, you know, I, I've... You'd have to, you'll have to go back and watch what I said, I guess, in the earlier in the earlier pieces uh, that I did for Terry, because this is getting quite long. So that's everything. Part four, uh, the final chapter. There won't be a sequel um, unless uh, or until I get at least another four or five Terry Riley albums, which will probably be sometime, um, but I, but not not in the very near future. And um, that's it. I hope maybe uh, anybody that's interested in Terry, maybe uh, this helped as a kind of buyer's guide a little bit. I only have an overview of his works, I, I, you know, um, so I, did, I couldn't even pick, if I had everything, I could pick out albums that you should get maybe versus albums that should be ignored. But I just showed everything I had, you know, good, bad, or indifferent or whatever. So. I just want to reiterate, though, that uh, even for those albums I'm not crazy about, uh, in a lot of cases, I think it's just beyond my comprehension. And uh, like I said, and I, and I bring it up again because uh, it's a very important point. Remember, this is Terry Riley's world. We're just living in it. So I didn't want you to forget that. I'll be back with my regular tomfoolery now that I've finally gotten to the final chapter of Terry Riley. Okay, guys, hope everything's going groovy out there for you all. It's uh, evening once again here in the, in the garage. And um, I'll, be back old, I'll be back sooner than you want me to be back. I guarantee you that. Okay? I'll see you soon. Tune in next time for more Tales from the Garage.